as we are now um, in week 11 of our study in Genesis of the life of Abraham, and I know some of you are thinking, boy, we haven't heard much from Abraham for a while because we've sort of been stuck in, 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 in chapter 19 for a while looking at Sodom and Gomorrah. There, there's a lot there, uh, and, and, and sadly, much of it seems far too familiar, I guess, for, for us uh, in our time. And, and, uh, but, but here's the thing. Today, we're, we're, we're going to finish up with a lot today, um, and we'll get back to Abraham next week. But we do have one more, one more message as we turn to Genesis chapter 19. We're going to pick up on uh, verse number 30. That's Genesis 19, verse number 30. Lot and his two daughters left Zoar and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zoar. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man around here to lie with us, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine, and then lie with him, and preserve our family line through our father. That night they got their father to drink wine, and the older daughter went in and lay with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I lay with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight, and you go in and lie with him, so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also, and the younger daughter went and lay with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son. May the Lord add his blessing to this hearing of his holy word. The question at hand this morning is a relatively simple one. How did we get here? How did we get here? And I'm not, I, I'll be honest right now, I'm not talking about the ugly scene that was just played out before us in our, in our scripture reading this morning concerning Lot and his daughters, although eventually we will get there. I promise we will. What, what, what I'm talking about, how do we get from, oh, I don't know, the 1950s and 60s where Lucy and Desi had to sleep in twin beds just to satisfy the censors to uh, what is now seen as acceptable, as uh, okay to watch primetime television. I mean, here's the thing. Sexual sin, it, it has been around as long as human beings have been around. But well, we live in a time like no other, don't we? A time like, like, like no other, where, where sexual obsession seems to be the driving force. It's around us everywhere you turn. So I ask again, how did we get here? According to one study, and this is just amazing to me, according to one study, 51% of boys and 32% of girls have actually viewed pornography before they reach the age of 13. Is that amazing? How? 13, how did we get here? Well, certainly the internet had, had a role to play in all that. I understand that. I mean, but it, it, it's sad. It's scary. Frankly, it, it, it's sickening. Ultimately, uh, leads us to ask the question, where will it end, right? You ultimately get here, right? I think of the words of... Billy Graham's late wife, Ruth, who was quoted as saying, if God doesn't punish America, well, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> maybe she's right, huh? Or maybe, maybe God will simply allow us to self-destruct. Maybe it's happening even now, right before our very eyes. I think of the words of Dr. Carl Zimmerman. He a Harvard sociologist. He wrote a book entitled Family and Civilizations. He concludes that the deterioration of civilizations throughout history follow this certain, certain pattern. He studied the, the, the rise and the fall of, of great civilizations, and he determined that there were five characteristics that were common to great civilizations as they began to deteriorate. I want you to listen to those five characteristics here this morning and see if they don't sound at all familiar. Here's what he lists. He says, first, marriage lost is sacred. 
sacredness. Divorce became commonplace, and alternative forms of marriage were accepted. Second, feminist movements undermined complementary and cooperating roles as women lost interest in mothering and pursued personal power. Third, parenting became increasingly difficult. Public disrespect for parents and authority increased, and delinquency and promiscuity became more commonplace. Fourth, adultery was celebrated, not punished. People who broke their marriage vows were admired. And fifth, there was an increased tolerance for incestuous and homosexual sex with an increase in sex-related crime. Any of that sound even vaguely familiar to any of you today? I, I know you, you, you're, you're thinking, even as I read those, or at least I was thinking this, maybe you weren't, but, 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 but uh, as we read these five characteristics uh, that lead to a decaying culture, you're thinking they, they sort of sound like they describe our current social or cultural or moral scene in America today. And, and, and I'll be honest, I can't disagree with you if that's where your thoughts go, but the point is, and I want to be very adamant about this point this morning, these were not written by some radical right-wing fanatic. They weren't written by some politically incorrect evangelical Christian who's just trying to convict America, get them to repent and change. These were written by an author named Carl Zimmerman, and the year he wrote them was 1947. 1947 a time when family and marriage were sacred in our nation, a time when sexual sin certainly was not celebrated. He was merely historically documenting, detailing the downfall of great civilizations. And he did it during a period of time in our history where none of these five characteristics would have been common to our nation. So the question remains, how did we get here? How did we get here? Well, this morning, this morning we, we look at the lives of Lot and his daughters in an effort to maybe come up with some of the answers to that very question. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the lessons found in it. And we pray that as we reflect upon it this morning, that you would speak to us loud and clear, that we would hear you, understand you, and through your spirit apply your lesson, your teaching, to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we last saw Lot, he and his daughters were heading east, right? They were heading through the valley towards this small town, um, uh, which is now near the edge of, of the Dead Sea. Sadly, we are to assume, right, that things didn't work out so well there. I mean, that's the assumption I think we can make based on the scripture beginning with verse number 30, where we hear that Lot and his daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his daughters, they lived in a cave. Now, remember last week's message for a moment? You remember the scripture from last week? You might recall that, that, that the angels wanted Lot, right? They wanted him to go with his daughters to the mountains in the first place, right? Right? That was, that's what God wanted. That's what the angels wanted. But Lot, he resisted. He even convinced the angels to let him go with his daughters to this small, small village, small town. And, and, and they relented. And I find that interesting, don't you? That's the first thing I find interesting. when I, The very first verse of this text, I, I, I look at it, and, and I'm just saying, sometimes, sometimes God makes it very clear to us what is in our best interest, Right? Maybe through his word, maybe through uh, the, the, the advice of another Christian, maybe even uh, periodically through a message from a pastor. He'll tell us what is best, what we ought to do. And we resist. Whether out of fear, as seemed to be the case with Lot, or out of pride, or out of greed. For whatever reason, God has made it clear what we ought to do, what is in our best interest, but we resist doing it. And God lets us resist. He allows us to make our own choices. We call that what? We call that free will, right? He allows us to do that. But I ask the question here this morning, how often do we look back and think to ourselves, oh, how I wish I'd have just done it His way in the first place. I would have saved myself so much trouble. 
I would have saved my, myself so much aggravation and pain, not to mention time. If I, I got to wonder, as Lot and his daughters ultimately made their way back to that mountain, what he was thinking concerning that message the angels gave him just a, a short time earlier. In any event, we've identified these five characteristics, right? Five characteristics of a deteriorating civilization. But let's be honest. Decay and moral decay usually happens one family at a time, right? One family at a time. And if we look at Lot's family, I think we, we begin to get a picture of what a family in moral decay might look like. Now, we don't know how long they've been living in the cave. We don't know that uh, because it's not mentioned in the text. But here's what we know. Back in Sodom, these young ladies had fiancés, right? We know that because they didn't listen when Lot warned them. They wouldn't go, so they perished. They had fiancés. They had men who they were pledged to be married to. But now, well now, there are no men in sight. Either figuratively or literally, it would seem. So, I mean, what's a girl to do, right? What's a girl to do? Well, first, let me assure you what they are not to do. They are not to get their father drunk and attempt to conceive a child through them, okay? That's what, but, but how did they get here? How did they get to this point? You see, I, as I reflect upon this, I, I see a, a deeper problem at work here in this family. Remember, this is a family that God in His grace and in His mercy saved, right? Yet there is no mention of God in this text whatsoever, is there? No mention whatsoever. There is no thought that maybe the same God who saved them from what was going on, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, who saved them, might actually provide for their needs now. There's no mention of that. Frankly, there doesn't even seem to be any real appreciation for what God has done in the past for them. And, and, and guess what? When, when you do not have an appreciation for what God has done in the past, um, generally speaking, you're not seeking God's direction for the future. It just doesn't happen. It's, they sort of go hand in hand. And so with this in mind, these daughters, they don't pray to God. There, 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 there is no um, asking the God who saved them to, 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 to provide for them or to direct them. Instead, they implement their own plan, right? That's what they, they take matters into their own hands. You see, when a family does not recognize God for who He is, when they do not appreciate God for what He has done, when they do not pray to that God, their God, our God, for direction, and then patiently wait for His answer, instead taking matters into their own hands, this is a sure fire sign of a family in moral decay. It just is. It just is. You see, once God is removed from the equation, moral discernment becomes totally distorted, doesn't it? Totally di 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 distorted. Deciding what is, is to be done that now becomes driven by, by personal desires. And those personal desires are oftentimes prompted by you know, the world that you've been exposed to, right? What you see around you. What's going on? Sadly, the world that these two girls have been exposed to is what? It's the world of Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? Who knows how many incestuous uh, relationships these girls have been exposed to? I mean, we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah now. The point remains, a family that leaves God out of the equation um, and instead exposes the family to worldly living, that's a family in moral decay. It's a family in moral decay. But if we look deeper at what's going on here, at the heart of this situation, it's a sad reality that, that these girls have absolutely no respect or honor for their father either, do they? There's no respect going on here. And, and, and you could rightly ask the question, why would they respect their father, right? I mean, by all accounts, he was not a spiritual uh, head of the household. He did not appear to be a, a righteous man. For goodness sakes, this is the same man who sometime earlier offered up his two daughters to the men of Sodom and Gomorrah that they might sleep with him. You know, the example he has set for them. What is his example he set for them? 
It's one of conforming to the world around you to get what you want. That's the example that Lot has set. So his daughters, they don't honor him. They do not respect him. He has lost credibility, if you will, in their eyes. He has lost his authority. And so getting him drunk and being intimate with him, well, from their perspective, why not? Huh? Why not? Given everything they've been exposed to. Let me tell you something. As parents, especially as husbands and as fathers, we are called to be spiritual heads of our house. That's what the Bible calls us to be. To set an example for, for our wives and our children and those around us to follow. And, and not just to say words uh, uh, about what is right and what, versus what is wrong, but to put those words into action in our daily lives. As for Lot, that, that just didn't happen. You see, when there's a breakdown of parental, parental authority, and, and, and I would say especially when it comes to a father and a husband, that's a sure sign, a surefire sign that uh, this is a family in decline, in decay. And the longer that decline is allowed to go on, the easier it becomes to do what might otherwise seem like unthinkable. Right? It's, it's a slippery slope. Um, when you live in the world, you know, one seemingly innocent act can lead to another, and then to another, and then to another. And eventually, you, you, you just don't even give it much of a thought, do you? You just, you just sort of do it. You know, our, our children, those around us, when, when they're exposed to immorality repeatedly, whether it's our example, whether it's the TV that they're watching, whether it's the friends they associate with, um, whether it's the music, they, oh, you know, uh, when they're exposed to those sort of things over and over again, eventually they become desensitized to them. They just do. Lot's daughters have become totally insensitive to what is right and what is wrong. It's a family in moral decay. And so these girls put into motion their sinful plan. And guess what? It works! They both become pregnant. They have two sons. You know the names of those two sons? They weren't mentioned in Scripture. You know what the names are? One uh, uh, of the son is, is, uh, is called Moab. Meaning, and literally meaning, from father. Wow. What a legacy, huh? Moab, from father. The other is ben meaning son of my kinsman. What a legacy. And this is pretty much the, the last we hear of, of Lot, at least in the, in the Old Testament. We'll return, as I said, to, to, to Abraham next week. But what a way to go out, huh? What a way to go out. But here's the thing. I will proclaim to you this morning, there are lessons to be learned from Lot. And, and from his daughters. And, and if we're smart, we'll listen to those lessons and we'll pay attention to them. And, and here's the, the first thing I would say. I, th I think we might begin by being alert to the subtle lies that Satan throws our way. I mean, we, 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 we've asked the question over and over again this morning, how did we get here? How did we get here? Well, let me assure you, it wasn't overnight. Okay? It, 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 it happened very gradually, over a period of years, very subtly. That's how Satan works. Very, very subtly. Uh, if it had happened overnight, we, we probably would have never allowed it to happen, right? Uh, I mean, you know, if last year's television schedule, think about this for a minute, if, if last year's television schedule included I Love Lucy and Dick Van Dyke and Father Knows Best and Gunsmoke, and then all of a sudden, this year was replaced by scandal or sex in the city or sons of anarchy. Guess what? There'd be an outcry. Those shows would never have had a chance. But because you had years of subtle change, subtle change from, from wholesome to, to gruesome today, pretty much anything goes now, right? Almost anything goes. And until we as Christians say no more, it's only going to get worse. Frankly, it starts one home at a time. 
You need to be on guard for these subtle changes in your home. These subtle changes in your children, in your grandchildren's lives, nieces, nephews. You know what? When they begin to listen to scary music, you need to take note. That's a sign, okay? When, when, when they begin to say certain words, maybe of sexual uh, connotation or maybe angry words, that's a sign that something's going on here. When they start hanging out with a crowd that is questionable in nature, that's a sign. We need to watch for subtle signs in our world and in the world of our children and the people around us, and we need to nip them in the bud. We need to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> no more. We will serve the, that music, those movies, that television, that lifestyle, not going to take place in my home. We need to take a stand for God. But more than simply saying it, more than just declaring it, we must model this way of life that God calls us to. That's the only way people around us are ever going to accept it. Lot did not model righteousness, okay? And frankly, his daughters followed his lead. They just did. As parents or grandparents, as church leaders, as, as Christians living in a dark, dark, dark world, if we don't start modeling righteous living, model God's way instead of the world's way, things are only going to get worse. They're going to get worse in our homes. They're going to get worse in our workplaces. They're going to get worse in this nation. And I know that's a hard thing to, 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 to even comprehend. How did we get here? How did we get here? Well, Lot was a passive parent. He was a passive parent. He allowed things to happen under his watch. But here's the thing, you and I as Christians, we've been way too passive. We have been way too, way, way too passive and for way too long. We've allowed much of what's going on in the world to happen, to happen under our watch. A passive parent who shrugs their shoulders and says, what can I do? They're part of the problem. A passive Christian who shrugs their shoulders and says, what can I do? Equally part of the problem. We need to step up. And we need to make a difference. And one way is to lead by example. To lead by example. Another is to share the love of Christ with those around us. Certainly, that's part of, of, of why we feel so called to be part of this diaper ministry here at First Baptist that's kicking off ne next month. We, we need to, to, to understand and remember, as we say here often, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. We need to find ways to show people that we truly care about them. We also need to take a stand for God's way, okay? And under that umbrella includes prayerful and biblical uh, 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 backgrounds, understanding before we enter the voting booths this November. We need to be prayerful. We need to read our Bibles. We need to, we, we need to, 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 to look at, at our candidates very closely these candidates who will ultimately be in positions of authority in our nation. We need to look at uh, those who will be overseeing moral and social issues of our time. And we need to see how they line up from a biblical perspective. We need to look at these candidates and see where they stand concerning life. We need to see where they stand concerning marriage. We need to look at these candidates and see where they stand concerning the care for the less fortunate. And we need to look at what God has to say about these issues versus what the candidates have to say about them. And frankly, you know what? We might, we might use Zimmerman's five characteristics back here of a civilization in decay as a starting point. You know what, for, for a starting point for evaluating candidates. And understand, doing that will not be politically correct, okay? It will not be politically correct, but it will be biblically correct. And that's all that really matters. And purely from an historical perspective, as history has shown us, it's just a good idea, okay? It's just a good idea. And all of this will also fall under the heading of seeking God's direction. 
seeking God's direction for your life. Yesterday, at our men's prayer breakfast, we, we did a Bible study, a little devotion using uh, Psalm 25 as our backdrop. And in that Psalm, David, over and over again, is seeking God's direction for his life. Understanding that God knows everything and God wants what's best for us. And so David, over and over again in that psalm, and if you get a chance, you ought to read that, he over and over again seeks God's direction. And, and, and I challenged the men as we sat around that table. There were nine or ten of us sitting around the table. I, I said, this is his prayer, seeking God's direction. I said, that's the main theme here. I, and I said to, to them, I said, what's the main theme of your prayers? And this wasn't a right or wrong answer. And, 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 and some of them said, you know, forgiveness. Seeking God's forgiveness. And, and, and another one said seeking God's strength. And another one said you know, uh, uh, interceding for others. Intercessory prayer, which, which I agreed with. And I, I said, and that's all good stuff. It's all important stuff. I said, but how much time do you spend praying for God's direction? How many days do you wake up and say, God, here's what I have, have, have thought out for the day, but boy, this day is your day. You tell me what I need to do today. You lead me. You direct me. How many times over the course of a day when, when you have something come up and you don't know what to say to somebody, do you say, God, help me. Give me words to speak. How often is that the theme of your prayers, God, direct my path? How often? And, 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 and we were convicted as men, I think, a little bit yesterday. And we said, we need to do more of that. We need to be seeking God's direction more. And I think that happens here too. We saw these girls did not seek God's direction. You know why? Because they probably never saw a lot. Their father seeking God's direction. We, as leaders in this church, as leaders in our homes, we need to set the example of seeking God's direction and letting those around us know that our agendas are secondary. It's all about His agenda. It's about His plan. We need to turn to God regularly. It's time to make a difference in this world that we are called to be ambassadors in. How do we get here? Well, let's be honest. You and I had a role to play in getting us here. How do we get out of here? We have a role to play there as well. For Lot, it was too late. The die had been cast. For you and I, the window's still open. The question remains, for how long? Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You for Your patience with us. Even as we fail to, to respond to Your ways, to even seek them out sometimes. For Your patience with us. When we conform too much to the world and not enough to Your ways. Your, your, your grace, Your forgiveness. But we acknowledge, Lord, that You have called us to be Your light in a dark, dark world, to be leaders in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces, to share the love, the light of our Savior Jesus Christ with those around us. And so we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would embolden us and that you would encourage us to lead by example and that you would use us in a mighty way that we might be your light in a dark, dark world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.